What's up everybody? My name is Circus, aka Stealing Your Mail, and I am bringing you an intermediate slash beginner's guide to Hunt Showdown. Now, there's a lot of fantastic beginner guides out there, but they're mostly geared towards players that are either brand new to Hunt or completely new to FPS games. Hunt is a pretty intricate game, and a lot of the information past beginner level isn't really readily available. It's just stuff that you have to learn as you go. So I wanna share some of that knowledge with you, and this guide is going to be applicable to all skill levels, but if you're a player with 50, 100, couple hundred hours, I'd really encourage you to stick around because we're going to talk about some fundamentals of the game, as well as some of my own thoughts and opinions so that you can build off of them and make your own decisions further down the road. If that sounds good to you, let's get right into it. So first things first, let's talk a little bit about MMR, which is Hunt Showdown's skill-based matchmaking system. MMR is a hot topic right now. I've heard that people are getting matched with players that are significantly beyond their skill level, and to be fair, I've seen some of that in my own games too. I'm not here to talk about balance or solo revive or anything like that, but I will say this. Back in the day, we couldn't see our MMR in Hunt, and I'm not convinced that the game actually had a system in place for it. At its core, Hunt is a battle royale. That means that you're going to come across situations and other players that you might not be ready for. You can't control who you're matched with, but what you can control is your aim, your awareness, and your game sense. So focus on those and try your best and have fun. You can click here to hide your MMR so that you can forget about it and I would encourage you to do so. In a similar fashion, money does not matter in Hunt Showdown. Now, if you run Spitzer Mosin and Dolch Precision every single game and you keep getting dumpstered, you're probably going to wreck your finances. But unless you're consistently running these very expensive loadouts, you're probably not going to go broke. If you are collecting clues, looting dead players, banishing bosses, and extracting tokens with some regularity, you're going to be making money. There's really no point in budget loadouts because of that. Now, if you want to use a budget loadout to challenge yourself, I won't fault you for that. But don't be afraid to use the guns and gear that you want because money does not matter. We'll talk about cost-effective weapons and what makes one weapon more efficient than another in a little bit. But I do want to stress that you really should not worry about money in this game. And it's the same thing with Gear Fear. There are no rare items in Hunt or items that cannot be bought by each player. So there's nothing that I can obtain that you cannot. If you get a Contraband Mosin Sniper, but you don't have it unlocked yet in the Book of Weapons, a few games with any Mosin variant will get you there. So don't hoard your stuff, play the gear you want, and don't be afraid to lose it. So let's take a look at a relatively meta loadout. What you're seeing on screen is a universal loadout that I use in solos, duos, and trios. Now, this isn't the be-all end-all loadout, so don't hesitate to change it around. I'm not showing the best loadout, I'm showing what works for me and why I use it. The rule is we want our melee tool and our first aid kit on the same hotkeys every single game. I like my melee tool on 3 and my first aid kit on H. Use whatever works for you, but keep it consistent and your muscle memory will thank you. Having the right tools allows us to move around the map faster, which is a huge advantage in Hunt Showdown. Typically, it's beneficial to either be the first or the last to a location. Controlling the pace at which we enter engagements is very important, and bringing in a good set of PvE tools is one method we can use to do that. We bring the first aid kit because we need heals. We bring the choke bombs because we're good teammates. Chokes have a variety of uses, like slowing down a push by choking a door. You can use them to make camping hunters cough to get some information. The more you think outside the box with choke bombs, the more you come to appreciate them. The rule is, we're going to bring chokes whenever we play with other players, unless we have a good reason to not bring them in. I'm a throwing axe enjoyer, you only get two, so they're a bit of a commodity. But they're great against hives, concertina armored, hellhounds, chicken coops, dog kennels, horses, and bosses. You can even kill water devils with them, but that's not really their best use. So right there, we have a single tool that can dismantle all the annoying AI monsters and noise traps in the entire game. Plus, if you can't find a melee weapon and it's time to fight a boss, the throwing axes can do a ton of damage. When it comes to the actual melee tool, I prefer the knuckle knife. The dusters are the most efficient PvE weapon in terms of stamina usage, and the knife is the best PvP weapon. The heavy knife isn't really that great, and I don't recommend it. The knuckle knife gives us the best of both worlds though. We have the light duster attack for emulators and the heavy stab for everything else. In terms of consumables, it is very meta to run two large regeneration shots. They last for 10 minutes each, so we have 20 total minutes of HP regen. Match of Hunt has a maximum time limit of 45 minutes. And since we don't want to pop our regens right off the rip, we want to wait 
either until the first big fight, or worst case, the first time we take significant damage, we're likely going to have HP regen for the duration of the important part of any match. Plus, if you go down and get resurrected, the shot is still active. I strongly recommend bringing in a throwable with some lethality to it, so your dynamite or your frags. Throwing something can obviously get you that easy kill, but hunters have to respect it and they have to move, which means their footsteps, or lack thereof, is giving you information. The high bomb is also solid and it's a little bit slept on, but keep in mind that Shadow can negate the high bomb entirely. Concertina bomb is also a good choice, it has a lot of utility. You can block a doorway, block a res, etc. So if we want to change things out, the throwing axes are the first thing to change. If we're playing solo, we can get rid of the choke bombs first. We can also forego our melee tool and run only the throwing axes, but this works best if we have stamina shots and or conduit. For the consumables, we can take two small regeneration shots if we want to save some money. They last for 5 minutes each, and the cool thing is with regens, we're paying for duration, not effectiveness, so 10 total minutes of HP regen is more than enough for most games. We can also skip bringing in a throwable, because we will absolutely find something when we're looting item boxes or other players out in the bayou. Money doesn't matter in this game, and increasing your odds of survival by bringing in the proper tools and consumables can go a very long way towards improving. Now, I keep saying that money doesn't matter, and that we don't need budget loadouts, and that we should always use the gear that we want to. While that is true, there are certain weapons in the game that are more economical than others. If we are looking to be just a little bit frugal, then these are good options, not necessarily because they are cheap, but because they are efficient for their cost. A good example of this is the Sparks. It's $130 and it does 149 damage to the upper chest. A hunter at full health has 150 HP, so if they've taken any damage from any source and they are hit in the upper chest with the sparks, they go down. The other aspect of the sparks that makes it so efficient is that it doesn't need custom ammo. Custom ammo can inflate a weapon's price and the sparks is arguably made worse by its custom ammo options, although in the current meta, the fire ammo might be a side grade. Long ammo is great when enemies are missing health bars, the stock ammo can penetrate, and the stock ammo is plentiful to pick up in the bayou. If we want a pistol that mimics the efficiency of the sparks, we want the packs for $80. So the packs is medium ammo, which means it has some range and some punch, and that makes it pretty easy to two-tap with at the right range. Now, it is made better by some of its custom ammo options, but it works great as is, and the stock ammo is more plentiful to pick up. The packs also draws faster than the Scott Field, and it's great with fanning. An alternative to the packs that shows how custom ammo inflates the price is the Caldwell conversion. So at 55 bucks, it's a cheap pistol, but it is made substantially better with FMJ for another $50, which ultimately makes it into a pocket uppercut that costs $105. Now, you can run the conversion stock, but it is so much better with the FMJ that that should really just be factored into the weapon's cost. It's a great handling pistol, and it's great with fanning, but you're not getting the same gun at $55 as you are at $105. Now, if we really want to make something out of nothing, the Winfield C is my go-to. So its bigger brother, the Winfield Swift, is one of the best weapons in the entire game, full stop. The Winfield C is very similar, but the main difference is being its lower ammo capacity and its slower reload speed. The Winfield C is a sleeper because it feels like it's the game's starting gun. But it's $41, and that's tough to beat. We compare it with a little Nagant pistol for $24. For $65 total, we have 48 bullets worth of close to medium range headshots. Now of course you can put high velocity on these to make the Winnie even better, but that obviously increases the price, and the Winnie is fine on stock ammo because of how the gun is best utilized. There are some weapons that get mentioned in budget loadout videos that I don't think are very good for that purpose, and the foremost one is the Romero. So the Romero is $66 and it has 14 meters of range. It's a great weapon, don't get me wrong, but it has two issues. The first is that slugs triple the price of the gun if we take them in both ammo slots. The second is that it's very tough to get enemy hunters to play your game when you have a Romero. So say you're in trios and your buddies go down and it's a 1v3. You fire the Romero and you get a pick. The remaining two players, if they're competent, are either going to push you simultaneously or not at all. You don't have the rate of fire to confidently kill both of them quickly, and you need to force them to make mistakes. So again, it's not a bad weapon, but if you're at a stage where you're looking at budget loadout videos, it might not be the best choice. An alternative to the Romero would be the crossbow, which is $50. 
It suffers from the same problems as the Romero, but it provides a lot more utility in our loadouts because it is effectively a silent shotgun. So the crossbow allows us to get rid of throwing axes or to focus less on tools for dealing with AI, while allowing us to keep a good pace while we move around the map. And if we want to save more money, we can use the hunting bow instead. By the way, if you right click any item in your loadout, it will send it back to your inventory. Okay, so we just extracted it with a bounty. We looted a Mosin and an uppercut off of some sweat. We're going to take that into our next game. But before we do that, we're going to get some traits. So trait points come in waves. After our first clean game, we're going to be about level 25. The amount of trait points we get for subsequent successful games is going to diminish because it takes more and more XP for our hunter to level up. So after the first game, I recommend you spend all of your trait points. Keep in mind that you can cash in traits you don't want. It costs one point and the rest of the traits cost is refunded to you. I like to frame traits as offensive, utilitarian, or defensive. I like to get my offensive traits online first and then a combination of utility and defense traits next. Good offensive traits make your guns that much more lethal. A good example is fanning. Fanning is quite expensive, but it makes pushing hunters and defending yourself that much better. Shooting from the hip is very strong in hunt, and the trick to fanning in a 1v1 is to outpace your opponent's rate of fire and not to shoot your gun as fast as you can. Traits like Iron Sharpshooter and Iron Repeater allow you to work the action of those respective weapons while aiming down the sights. This has the side effect of increasing your rate of fire, and it's easier to two-tap somebody with a Mosin when you have Iron Sharpshooter than without it. So this would be when I would pick up Bullet Grubber, Steady Aim, Levering, a Scopesmith, anything I didn't already have that makes my weapons better. Lightfoot is also a great pickup here. It makes the things we're going to be doing anyway, such as jumping, vaulting, climbing ladders, that much better by making them quieter. At six points, it's just as offensive as it is defensive, and it's one of the best traits in the entire game. Other good utility choices are Conduit for the stamina, Pack Mule for the extra loot, Serpent to help us deal with bounty campers, Necro for the revives, and Frontiersman. Frontiersman is a bit expensive at 7 points, but the extra first aid charge is nothing to sneeze at, and Frontiersman is awesome if we're running traps. Other good options would be Magpie, and even Greyhound if we don't have a method of getting a stamina buff. For our defensive traits, Bloodless deserves a special mention. The Drilling, the Centennial, and the Springfield can all run medium dum dum ammo. This causes heavy bleed when you get tagged, and it can leave you with seconds to respawn before you're out of luck. Bloodless gives us just a little bit of a buffer, maybe get away with a play that we otherwise wouldn't be able to make. Sal skin is similar. Getting hit by fire ammo within a weapon's effective range is going to light you on fire. Sal skin prevents this, and both the Sparks and the Martini Henry can take fire ammo, and they're both quite good with it. Resilience is also a great trait, both for solos and for teams. It's pretty cheap at 3 points, and it's one of my first pickups when I play solo. Other cheap traits that you can spend your extra points on are Dauntless and Bulwark. You may have noticed that I haven't mentioned two very good traits, Physician and Doctor. Doctor, before the buffs to the regeneration shots, was the best trait in the game even at 9 points. It doubles the health restored by first aid kits, effectively doubling your uses of them. It was previously the most important trait to take and the one that you wanted to get running first. I don't think Doctor is a must take anymore considering its cost, which means Physician isn't as good either. They're still useful, but if your primary method of healing is regeneration shots, then you can supplement them with your first aid kit, and the points spent on these traits would be better spent elsewhere. With all that said, that's going to do it for this video and for the first part of this guide series. If you stuck around this long, consider giving me a like and subscribe. I hope to see you in the next part where we're going to get more into gameplay. In the meantime though, good luck out there in the bayou.